Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the June 2023 Living Environment Readers Exam. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at Part A, which is questions 1 through 30. We're going to be starting off with question number 1, which asks us, which two body systems provide humans with the raw materials necessary for their cells to release energy, right? So whenever we have the release of energy, think ATP, right? Um, everything needs energy to work, right? But with living things, with living animals, humans are living animals, they need ATP, right? We take energy in the form of ATP. Our energy is ATP, right? And what it's asking us, and when we're releasing energy, right, that means that we're creating it. Release is, is the same thing as, as creating it, right, in humans. And it's asking us which two body systems give us the materials that we need to create ATP, right? So what do we even need to create ATP in the first place, right? You should know this formula. It's going to be glucose plus O2, which is oxygen, and that's going to give you H2O plus CO2 plus ATP, right? This is the formula for cellular respiration, right? That is the process by which you make ATP. Now, we know what the raw materials are necessary uh, to make ATP, right? It's going to be glucose and oxygen. That's what you need to make ATP. Now, what body systems actually give us those um, those materials? Obviously, it's it's going to be choice number three, right? The respiratory system, right? Our lungs and our diaphragm, the thing that lets us breathe, it lets us respirate, is going to give us that oxygen, right? This is going to give us our O2. And our digestive system, that's going to give us the sugar, right? Say I eat a cookie and... and um, my body can't use that cookie, right? It first needs to get break, broken down into sugars. That digestive system breaks that cookie down into sugars, into that glucose that I can actually use with the oxygen I get from my respiratory system or my lungs when I breathe in to make ATP, right? So it's going to be choice number three. Reproductive uh, system doesn't make sense. Nervous system also doesn't make sense. And muscular and skeletal system are the things that actually take in the energy that I just made. So if we move on to number two, it says an example of an activity that best contributes to maintaining homeostasis in an organism is what, right? So which activity uh, allow is, is an example of, uh, or, or allows us to to uh, maintain homeostasis, right? The question, the wording is a bit is a bit strange, but we could just eliminate it, eliminate some of these choices uh, because they don't make any sense, right? What I mean by that is choice number one, we could eliminate automatically because this isn't homeostasis at all, right? What homeostasis and maintaining homeostasis is, is uh, a reaction to your environment or a reaction to stimuli of your environment that will make you survive better. What I mean by that is, say it's really cold out, right? Um, that That is that is a an environmental factor, right? My body will then begin shivering to keep me warm, right? That is homeostasis. I'm reacting to a stimuli, right? I'm reacting to my environment in a way that makes me survive better or say it's really hot outside i in in order for me to not like heat stroke in order for me not to overheat my body is going to start sweating right that is a reaction to stimuli or reaction to your environment that helps you survive right so obviously knowing that uh homeostasis reaction to your environment that helps you survive or is beneficial right choices two and three are automatically off the table right if we just look at them right choice number two says a deer losing its fur at the start of winter how is that good you know that is a response to stimuli that's a response to an environment right but you want that's the opposite thing you want you want more fur at the start of the winter right losing its fur means you're going to freeze and you're going to die choice number three right a person's not sweating on a hundred fahrenheit degree day that's not, that's not even a response to stimuli that can't be homeostasis because it's always going to be a response to, to an environmental stimulus, right? There is no uh, response here, which means it cannot be homeostasis. But also, not sweating at 100 Fahrenheit degree day, that's, that, uh, uh, that's not homeostasis because you need to sweat when it's hot out. And that leaves us with choice number four as the right answer, a response to a chicken pox, a chicken pox vaccine, right? So that, that diseases are environmental factors, right? Say you 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 have a, a virus, right? You get infected. Uh, you're, you, you're going to have an immune, an immune response, right? Your immune system is going to respond to that uh, infection or, or to that um, virus that's now inside of your body. And that response is going to help you survive because that response is killing off that harmful virus. Um, uh, virus or bacteria inside of you, right? A response to chicken pox vaccination, right? Whenever you're vaccinated, they inject you with like a, a weakened version of the virus or a dead virus. And your body responding to a dead virus means that it's ready to fight off infections, right? So number three, 
uh, says equine cloning can be used to produce performance horses. Although horses are clones of one another, they may ex still exhibit slight differences in appearance. The differences in the physical characteristics of cloned horses most likely is the result of what? Right, so they're cloned. They're cloned horses, and these are all cloned horses. And what cloned means is that they're, they are genetically Right, they're genetically identical. They're all the same, genetically. But what this question is asking us is, hey, how come some of these horses look different than one another? How come this horse, uh, you know, this horse is, is taller than the rest of these horses? Or how come this one has this, this weird face, face marking, right? But this one has like a more like an arrow face marking, right? So obviously it's not going to be a, a natural selection, right? Because that doesn't make sense, right? Natural selection takes like like literally years to onset, right? That that is that is evolution. That's the thing that drives evolution. Um, natural selection does not take place in a person's lifetime, and that that natural selection can't occur with something that's cloned because natural selection needs random mutations, right? Natural selection is like the finches growing longer beaks or growing shorter beaks because they had a change in their environment, right? That doesn't make sense here. Uh, and really, the only choice that really makes sense here is choice number one, environmental influences, right? Sexual reproduction and changing gametes, that doesn't make sense because these are all cloned. These are these were all made by the same means, which is cloning, right? They, they, they were most likely done in a lab, right? They're, they're usually made in a lab. They, the specific genes were selected and given to, to these horses in development. Right, they were all altered, right? So really, changes in gametes and sexual reproduction doesn't matter because the development of these horses or the things by which they were developed, like the actual egg and sperm that were used to make these horses, were actually altered from the start, right? And they're altered from the start in a way that makes each one genetically identical. So them having different physical characteristics doesn't really make sense there, right? The only thing that makes sense here is an environmental change. And, and what I mean by this is, if you think about it, all of these are genetically identical, so they should be, should, should they, so they should also just be identical in general, right? If you have the same genes, you should all look the same. But say, say they're, they're made in a lab in, in like, uh, in New York, right? And one horse is, is one, one, one of these clones is given to a guy in Canada, right? And, and he locks this horse in a stable all day. While another another horse from New York is 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 uh you know moved to Kentucky, where its owner like forces it to run around every day, after a while that horse in 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 Canada, is is obviously going to be smaller than the horse in Kentucky because the horse in Kentucky has been running around all day. It's been growing muscle, right? Or say that the owner in Canada doesn't feed its horse that much, right? But the but the owner in Kentucky feeds the horse a lot. That horse is getting more food. Uh, which means that it's going to be bigger than the horse in Canada, right? That's a phys that's a difference in physical characteristics. Say that the horse in Canada has like longer fur than the horse in Kentucky because it's colder in Canada than it is in Kentucky, right? So even though they have the they're genetically identical, they have the same genes. The things in their environment, like the food or the temperature or just or their diet, right, or just the amount of physical exercise that they do, are are, are going to change how they look, right? Uh, this horse is, can be bigger than this because it was fed more, stuff like that, right? And also all, all these other ones, uh, choices kind of didn't make sense, right? So now we're moving on to number four, which says, which situation is an example of an organism responding to an abiotic factor, right? So whenever we're dealing with abiotic factors, right? That's, that's non-living. Non it's a non-living factor, it's not alive, right? Uh, and the answer to this is gonna be ch choice number one, straight off the bat, right? Plants in a forest grow to an area where there is more available sunlight, right? So it's an organism responding to an abiotic factor, right? Sunlight, is sunlight alive? Is that a living thing? No, that's that. those are photons, right? That's just the sun emitting like radiation, right? That's not alive. But what? look what's happening, right? The plants are growing towards that sunlight, right? That abiotic factor is it the, the, the plants or like an organism that a plant is an organism is now responding to that abiotic factor, which is the sunlight. It's responding to the sun by, by growing next to it, right? Um, rabbits attracting mates doesn't make sense because, you know, if you want to attract a mate, a mate is, is has to be another living animal, right? 
uh, woodpeckers peck holes in tr the trunks of trees to find insects for food, right? You're, you're, you're trying to find food. Food is living. Insects are living. Uh, deer eat tree bark in the winter when other food is scarce, right? If you're eating tree bark, you're eating trees. Trees are alive. Number five says uh, CRISPR slash Cas9 is a powerful system that bacteria use to, to cut and remove DNA from invading viruses. Uh, using CRISPR slash Cas9, researchers have successfully corrected a disease causing mutation for uh, muscular dystropathy in laboratory mice. Correcting the harmful mutation using CRISPR Cas9 is an example of genetic engineering, right? You are you are cutting and removing DNA, right? You're altering a DNA sequence to 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 you know have a specific effect, right? In this case, you know with the with these mice, you're you're cutting out that that code of DNA that could or that portion of DNA that could possibly um, or that did possibly cause them to have a a uh, mu the muscle disease, right? And because you're 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 altering genes, right? DNA DNA relates to your genes. Uh, it's called genetic uh, engineering, right? Cloning doesn't make sense here, right? Because uh, you're just you're removing DNA in already live mice. A biological evolution, nope. You're there's nothing biological about this, right? It's all in the laboratory setting. It's artificial, not. And also the the mice aren't evolving, right? They're they're already alive when they uh when they are receiving this like DNA treatment. Selective breeding doesn't make sense because they're never bred. Number six says many animal populations living in a particular area would most likely what, right? So if you have many populations and you're living in an area, they would have different they would have different niches, right? Uh, the thing with with ecology, right? The thing with ecosystems is each animal has its own unique place in the environment called a niche, right? For example, a a a hawk, right? A hawk would eat snakes. A hawk eats mice. And it's the only animal that would eat snakes or eat mice, right? Its role is to do that. But let's say a caterpillar, its role in, or its niche, right, is is to live on the ground and eat eat leaves, right? That's a different niche. That's a different role. It li it, it literally lives a different lifestyle, which is which is kind of a niche, right? The the hawk lives in in trees. The the um, I just say the caterpillar lives in the ground. The caterpillar eats leaves. The hawk eats other, other birds, right? So obviously it can't be number one because when you have two animals that occupy the same niche, they begin competing, right? Uh, the more diverse you are, the more diverse your, your environment is, the, the more niches you would, you would have, right? Because each animal has to have its own niche. If they don't have the same niche, they'll compete and one of them will end up probably probably end up dying out, right? But think about it, right? It's obviously gonna be choice number two. They're gonna have similar physical requirements. If you're living in a particular area, let's say you're living uh, next to a pond, right? Uh, and and it, it's like fish in a pond, right? Those fish, even though they have different niches, even though they eat different things, they still need food, they still need oxygen, they still need like a specific pH level right? Uh, so yeah, of course, they're going to have the same physical requirements because they're all in a similar environment. They're all in a similar area. Let's say that this was like a, like a tree, like they live in the jungle. They're going to need oxygen. They're going to need uh, space to live. They're going to need food. They're going to need like, a, if this is a species of birds, they all need like tree branches to build their nests on, right? They're going to have the same physical requirements because they all live in a similar area. The physical requirements from fish in a pond and and uh, birds in a tree are obviously going to di be different, right? Because they're not living in the same area. Uh, number three, eat the same food. Obviously, that's the same thing as occupying the same niche, right? That's that's clashing with the occupying the same niche because when you're usually when you're in a niche, when you have a role, you usually have one specific food source. But also, if everyone's eating the same food source and you have so you have like twenty different species of of, of birds and they're all all eating off feeding off of this one population of mice that's not gonna that's not sustainable right they're gonna they're gonna overhunt that one that one mouse or that one species of mouse right uh it's not gonna work and number four says require an input of solar energy obviously uh animal population not plant populations we don't we don't use sunlight number seven says cells pr process structures that perform specific jobs which they may correctly pairs a cell structure 
uh, sorry, which pairs a cell structure with a function it performs in the cell, right? So what, what's a cell structure and what's its role, right? So the cell membrane synthesizes proteins, that's wrong, right? Uh, the ribosomes synthesize proteins. The mitochondria provides energy for all cell processes. This is gonna be the right answer. Remember mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria produces ATP. Remember energy, same thing as ATP, throw back to question number one. Ribosomes make proteins, we just said that. They don't regulate materials and vacuoles don't transfer genetic information. Number eight says the endangered Everglades snail kite is a predatory bird which fee which usually feeds on small snails. Conservationists feared that the small that the snail kite would face a greater decline in the Everglades, sorry, decline when the Everglades was invaded by a species of larger snail that the birds had historically struggled to eat. But the snail kite population increased over several years and the snail kites now have larger beaks and bodies, right? So just for me to summarize, what happened was uh, you, had these, you had these birds, right? And they had pretty small beaks. Let's say their beaks looked something like this. And what, and what had happened, right? Is they've been they've been feeding on these on these small snails, right? Snails like maybe this big, right? And it fits in their beak. Then what happened was this was this uh, invasive species came in, right? Invaded by a species of larger snails, right? So this non-native species of snails, which are kind of like uh, like this big, now now came in to the environment, right? And what researchers thought that oh wait these these birds are gonna die right, die off because number one, these snails are now competing with the smaller snails, right? The big snails are going to kill off all the small snails because they're better because they're an invasive species. And because there are no small snails left, these birds are going to die off because they can't eat big snails, right? They struggle with it. Their beak is too small. They're not adapted to deal with these small snails. But then what actually happened was the opposite, right? What happened was these birds, right, eventually evolved to have larger beaks, right? They made their beaks longer, sharper, more curved, right? So whereas it was like this small last time, right? Now it's now it's up to here. So now that they have bigger beaks, they can now eat the bigger snails, right? And and their population increases because now they have more food, right? They can eat the small snails plus the big snails. So it ended up being an okay thing for the population because they managed to change the size of their beaks, right? And it's asking us what caused this change, right? Well, it's obviously going to be natural selection, right? Because if you think about it, at least one bird will, will, had a genetic mutation where it had a long beak. And while everyone else was struggling to get food, this bird with a big beak wasn't struggling at all. It was getting all the food. And as all the other birds that were struggling to get the food, you know, died off of starvation, this one bird with the big beak managed to perfectly survive and reproduce. And its children, at least one of the children that it had, had to have had this uh, this big beak, right? And and then as everyone else died, that bird, that offspring with the big beak survived. And what happened over time was every single bird with a big beak managed to survive and pass off their genes. That's called natural selection, right? The, the environment, right, made having a bigger beak more advantageous, right? If you had a bigger beak, you could survive better, which is the same thing as saying the environment selected for a bigger beak, right? Uh, and this is just a classic example of um, natural selection, right? Genetic engineering doesn't make sense. Humans didn't, you need to be a human and, and specifically alter someone's genetic code to engineer something. Selective breeding, once again, humans didn't step in here and, and, and they didn't force, uh, you know, birds with big beaks to breed. And ecological succession, Right, like that doesn't necessarily make sense here. Um, the random mutation makes sense, right? But but they didn't they didn't. There's no ecological succession happening, right? They're still they're still the same species. They're just with a bigger beak. Number ten says the New York State is uh, home to animals such as the eastern chipmunk. Chipmunk individuals with within this species are not genetically identical. This variability is a primarily primarily a result of what? Well, it can't be asexual reproduction, right? And it can't be uh mitosis right because asexual reproduction produces identical identical offspring rather genetically identical genetically identical offspring and mitosis right same thing right asexual reproduction is mitosis right and that is also uh they also produce genetically identical offspring right when if you reproduce via mitosis you're, you're it's it's 
I, the exact same copy. You're just producing copy after copy after copy. It's the same thing, right? They're asking about variability. These two eliminate, eliminate the possibility of variability. So now we're left with meiosis and recombination or sexual reproduction and cloning. Obviously, it's going to be choice number three, right? Because sexual reproduction, yes, that does create variability, but cloning does not, right? These two are like kind of con con clashing with each other, right? If I sexually reproduce, I'm going to have... Uh, my offspring are going to be not genetically identical to me, right? They're, uh, or they're going to be variations because when you sexually reproduce, it's a combination of two different parents' uh, DNAs, right? But with cloning, cloning produces genetically identical offspring, right? Which is which doesn't really make sense. Meiosis, right? My, with meiosis, you make egg and sperm. Egg and sperm combine. That that is sexual reproduction, right? And recombination, of course, is is how those genes, how your parents' chromosomes mix together to form yours. Right, and, and because they're mixing together, because genetic information is mixing, they're going to make uh, not genetically identical copies, right? So number 11, let me just drink some water real quick. Oh, I guess I skipped number 9, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, we'll go to number 9, then we'll go to number 11. Uh, scientists, it says that scientists turn specialized stomach cells from a mouse into skin cells by activating a specific gene responsible for the production of skin cells. Which claim can be made based on this evidence, right? So what happened here is that scientists took took a stomach cell, right? I'm just going to say that this is the stomach cell from a mouse and they turned it into skin, right? So they turned the stomach cell, right, into this skin cell. I'm just, I'm just going to make this um, a square. And how they did this was by activating a specific gene responsible for the production of skin cells. So what they really did was they came into the cell, right? They came into the nucleus and they and they flipped this switch on one of the one of the strands of the DNA, right? And the second that that DNA strand was flipped, the second that that DNA strand was unlocked or turned on, right? That cell then began replicating that piece of DNA, right? Began producing proteins from that piece of DNA, right? And those proteins ended up turning this cell and 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 turning the future cells made from the cell right, when it reproduced into skin cells, right? So what this shows, really, what this shows is that every cell in your body has the same code, right? But just specific parts of the code is turned off, right? So although your stomach cells belong in your stomach, right? They have the same, they're genetically identical to your skin cells, but different portions of that DNA is turned on or actually activated, right? So let's just say that this is your stomach DNA, right? Like the DNA found in a, in a stomach cell, right? Here's the DNA found in a, uh, in a uh, skin cell, right? These are the same. These are the same. But what happens is that, say, uh, this section, this portion of the stomach cell, right, is, is like blocked off, right? It's, it's tightly wrapped around so that it's it's un, it's made unreadable so although they have the same the same DNA they same this, this they share the same genetic information different parts of that code or different parts of that gene is actually turned on or off right this skin cell for example this part is turned off right so really what the scientists did was they just turned this back on right they made this part readable and because that part is readable um, they could now make skin cells, right? So same DNA, just different parts are are um, different parts are activated, right? So um, you can say that stomach cells have uh, genetic information to form other types of cells. Choice number one, right? Obviously, right? It had the genetic information, right? It had the code to form skin cells. It was just unactivated until the scientists came around and activated. So now we're moving on to number 11. It says zebra mussels are aquatic animals found in many fresh bodies of in many bodies of fresh water in New York State. These organisms are not native to North America. When these mussels first appear, their populations increased rapidly, which led scientists to fear their potential impact on the native species. Later, it began it, it had been observed that the rate of population growth of the zebra mussels has decreased. A reason for this decrease may have been what, right? So at first we had this like fresh environment full of food, full of full of space, full of oxygen, whatever. And then these zebra mus mussels pop showed in, right? We had like one right here. And what happened over the years is this population just kind of 
grew, grew, and then it grew rapidly, right? It began to rapidly increase exponentially, right? Same thing, rapid, exponential, whatever. And, but then all of a sudden, right, this, the growth began to stop, right? The growth rate began to stop. This, if this is the population, rather, if the y-axis is population, right, the population all of a sudden stopped growing so rapidly and it kind of just like, you know, stood around. Um, which means that, that it, they reached the carrying capacity, right? There's it, simply like they reached a limit to where they can't make more zebra mussels. Um, and the only choice that supports this, the only choice that actually gives you an option that would stop the growth of a population is choice number one. Resources needed for continued growth of their population are limited, right? You need so much space to, to be a muscle or you need so much oxygen in the water to be a muscle. If it goes above this line, if it continues growing, there's simply not enough space left for other zebra mussels to grow or there's not enough oxygen left in the water for other zebra mussels to grow, right? So there's a point, there's a limit to the amount of resources in the environment that these, that these zebra mussels can use to make more of themselves, right? Uh, competition, if there's a decrease in competition, the population would have continued growing, right? Because they have more food. Uh, if the food available to zebra mussels had decreased, reducing their rate of photosynthesis, their muscles, they don't go undergo photosynthesis. A lack of natural predators would make uh, the population increase once again, right? So usually the limiting factor for population growth, and this happens to almost every single species on this planet, right? They grow exponentially and then they run out of resources and then they stop growing exponentially and their population growth uh, balances out at a regular rate. So now we're moving on to 12. It says that uh, the diagram below represents a food web. Which statement best describes a relationship represented in this diagram, right? So the way that a food web works is you have arrows, you have different species, and you have arrows between them, right? And the way that you could read this is whatever wherever the arrow points to, it indicates where that species is going to. What I mean by this is the grass is going into the insects, which means that the that the grass is being eaten by the insects, right? A way I like to remember it is the arrow is showing you who's going into whose stomach, right? So the grasses are going to the insect stomach because the arrow is pointed toward the insects. The insects, right, are then going into the coyote's stomach, right? Because they're going into the coyotes, the arrow is pointed towards the coyotes. So that makes sense, right? So now let's just see which... Uh, which choice uh, summarizes that, right? So bushes are herbivores? No, because bushes don't eat plants. The bushes only go into people's stomachs, right? No one, the, no one goes into a bush's stomach. There's no arrows pointed to a bush, so that that can't be right. Rodents are consumers that feed on lizards. Well, where are rodents? Rodents feed on insects. The insects go into the rodent stomach, and the bushes go into the rodent rodent stomach, right? Rodents do not eat lizards. Ro uh, Roadrunners are carnivores that feed on insects. Roadrunners feed on insects. The insects go into the roadrunner's stomach, so it has to be choice number three. Uh, moving on to 13, it says cell, membrane in cell membranes inside the cell that line the stomach pump. Sorry. Cell membranes inside the cell that line the stomach pump hydrogen ions from areas of low concentration inside the cell to areas of high concentration outside of the cell. Which activity produces the ATP that makes this pumping possible? Obviously, choice number one, cellular respiration. We talked about this all the way in the first question. Cellular respiration is how you make ATP. Number 14 says, if scientists wanted to study the physical characteristic of an extinct animal that once lived in a specific area, the best source of information would be to investigate what? Well, if we're looking for physical characteristics, right? Obviously, we want to look at fossil records, right? Physical characteristics are best shown by bones. For example, right? Let's just say that we, we want to look at a... At a um, like an extinct species of human, right? Or that doesn't make sense. Let's say that we had a we had a common ancestor ancestors, right? Like let's for example, let's just say Neanderthals. We want to know how Neanderthals look like, right? And the best way we can figure out how they look like is to look at their bones, right? If they're bo if if this is a human and this is a Neanderthal, right? If their if uh, their leg bones are thicker and longer, right? Let's say that's uh that's a Neanderthal and this is a human's, right? If their leg bone, if their femur bone is longer, that means that obviously Neanderthals were taller, right? Because their bones are longer, their leg bones are longer. If their bones are thicker, that means that they had like more mass than humans because the bigger, thick, bigger your bone is, the, you know, the heavier you are, the more like muscle or fat you have on that bone. 
Oh, or let's say that we, we're, we're investigating like a prehistoric species of shark, right? Uh, right, this guy. Um, and, and we look at, we say, and we want to see what that shark looks like. We're going to look at its fossils. And, and when the best way to look at what, get an idea of what that shark looked like, we look at its fossils. And we could say, oh, yeah, uh, we could look at fossilized teeth. Oh, this shark had like really big and sharp teeth. That must mean it's a carnivore, right? Or, um, or, or, or how would we know that, that it had sharp teeth? How, how would we know that it had, uh, was a carnivore we would look at its dental records or dental fossils or how would we know how big it was we'd look at like say its spine like a fossil of its spine we're like oh wow this shark was seven meters long because the spine is seven meters long so what i'm trying to get at here is that fossils are the best indicator of physical characteristics right because fossils themselves are physical right animals that live in the area today don't make sense right producers the producer organism living in the area at that current time wouldn't tell us how they physically look like that would probably tell us their diet right or, or what how much energy was given to the to the to the animal and plants living in habitats similar to those uh, of long ago also kind of doesn't make sense right because the main thing is that fossils give off the best physical characteristics they tell you the most so number 15 says tasmanian devils are predators found on the tasman uh, tasman peninsula of australia their numbers were greatly reduced after two forms of contagious cancer appeared in the population. Scientists have found an effective cancer vaccine that has saved the number uh, saved a number of Tasmanian devils. That's a cute. I like that animal. Animal looks cute. But uh, it says the the beneficial effect of the vaccines will not be passed on to Tasmanian devils' offspring because of what? Obviously, it's because the vaccine didn't produce a change in the sex cells of the adults. Right? Think about it. The vaccine is given to to these uh, to these animals, right? That are already alive, right? This is alive. So it's injected into these animals, and now they're immune to cancer, right? But that just but that like immunity isn't passed on to their children, because what get well think about it. What gets passed on to the children? The genes get passed on to the children. Genes get passed on to the children, right? What carries genes well the egg right the egg plus sperm those carry the gene the genes right but guess what the vaccine doesn't act on egg or sperms uh sperm cells right vaccines act on completely different cells they make your body cells right or, or your muscle cells or your your immune system your immune cells produce like uh, antibodies or proteins that that help fight cancer right but because the vaccine doesn't affect doesn't change how your egg or sperm cells are produced, it doesn't change the, the material, the genetic material that your egg and sperm cells are produced by. Obviously, the effects of the vaccine aren't going to get carried into the offspring, right? Cancer caused the body of adults to produce antigens against that. That doesn't make sense, right? Whenever you're de whenever you're, you're looking at something being passed on to offspring, you're always going to have to be de dealing with sex cells, right? And because it didn't change the sex cells, which is where the offspring get that information from, the offspring aren't going to get that, you know, cancer vaccination. So 16 is saying that usually snakes reproduce sexually. However, some female copperhead snakes sometimes produce offspring asexually without sperm from a male. Compared with snakes formed by sexual reproduction, the offspring of these asexually reproduced snakes have what? Well, obviously, they're going to have limited genetic variation, right? If you're reproducing asexually, I think I said this in a previous question, be like three questions back, right? If you're producing asexually, you're making identical copies of yourself, right? Identical. If you asexually reproduce, if I asexually reproduce, I'm gonna have the exact same person as me, right? Because we have the exact same genetic uh, information, right? Expressed in the exact same way, right? Contain more DNA, that doesn't make sense, right? Grow larger, that doesn't make sense. Have more genetic variation, none of these make sense because guess what? Asexual reproduction equals uh, producing genetically identical offspring. Number 17 says the brown anole is native to Cuba and the Bahamas. Male and female species share most most of the same genes. 
They are the same size when they hatch out of their eggs. However, during the first year, the males grow to be three times larger than the females. The most likely explanation for the differences in size between male and female animals is what? Male organisms are always larger than the female members of the species. This is wrong. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, well, obviously that, that's just, that's a way big overgeneralization. Usually in biology, you want to uh, stick away from, from uh, overgeneralizations. But also if you think, I don't know if you knew this, but anglerfish, uh, male anglerfish are like, like 10 times smaller than the, than the females. So that's not always true. Uh, number two, the males developed for a longer period of time. That that's also um, doesn't make sense, right? Because they're saying that uh, during the first year, the males grow to be three times larger, right? So they're both developing at the same time. They just at that same one year period, the males are three times bigger, right? So they haven't developed for a longer period of time. They've both developed for the same time. Number three says the females mutated during hatching, reducing their ability to grow. That also doesn't make sense because this happens to the entire species, right? Every single time an egg hatches or like a litter of these of these lizards hatch, right? They're um, uh, they're not always mutations are really really rare. So for a mutation to happen for every single female specifically in a litter of these of these animals every single time is extremely unlikely and most likely impossible. Right, so it's not three. Choice number four: hormone, hormones can expect gene expression, can affect gene expression. That makes the most amount of sense here, right? What makes uh, what makes this males grow faster is the amount of testosterone they have. Uh, what makes like you know you know uh, you know human males grow uh, taller than human females, right? Uh, the the hormones like right the, the testosterone makes uh, you know muscle growth, it makes you grow, you know, uh, FSH, you know, human growth hormone, all of those make you grow uh, bigger and bigger, right? And they're affecting gene expression, right? In this case, most likely to, to talk to uh, the males produce more testosterone than the females, right? And that testosterone affects gene expression. Specifically, it makes the gene uh, for like height or the gene for size or the gene for fat production increase, right? You have more of that gene which makes fat. We have more of that gene that makes, that makes uh, you taller, that forces you to make bone so you could be taller, right? So number 18 says, okay, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna pronounce that, right? So MG, I'm just gonna call it MG. MG is an autoimmune disease characterized by a weakness of skeletal muscle. It occurs when normal communication between nerve and muscle cells is interrupted. The weakness is limitless, likely due to what? Right, so the weakness happens, uh, when the normal communication between nerve and cell is disrupted, right? So here I have my brain and here I have my muscles, right? That's supposed to be like an arm, right? So the communication, right, between these two, right? The, the, the signal is cut off or it's interfering, right? Rather than having like full Wi-Fi and calling someone Rather than having like full service and calling someone, now you have like one bar, you know, or like two bars. So what what causes that, right? A lack of ATP in the muscle caused by a decrease in available carbon dioxide? That doesn't make sense, right? Because remember, we're trying to find something that, that is the cause of a limited connection, right? Number four, the ribosomes in the muscle cells failing to produce enough sugar for muscle contraction. How does that deal with 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 uh, communication between them, right? You don't need sugar to, to contraction and communication, two different things, right? We're trying to trying to rationalize. We're trying to find a reason why this connection between nerve and muscle is so bad, right? So we're left with choices two and three, because these actually have to do something with communication, right? The brain failing to send proper hormone signals to vacuoles, right? That's signaling, right? Or the failure of receptor molecules to receive chemicals chemical signals, right? Those are all signaling. Also, these are the only two things that actually connect the nerve and muscle systems together. One and three, one and four, we're just talking about some random things. Obviously the answer to this, to number uh, 18 is gonna be choice number three, right? The failure of receptor molecules on the muscle cells to receive chemicals produced by nerve cells. That makes the most sense, right? How do cells communicate? How does your nervous system uh, communicate with muscle cells? It, cell it sends these signals, right? And these signals, usually, usually bind to receptors located on the cell, right? 
So these these are the receptors, right? They're these kind of like these, these these hoops or these these claws, and the receptor molecules are specifically fit inside of them, right? You have all these receptors coming in, and they're gonna go and they're gonna dock, right, to one of these. And the second that it docks to one of these, something in the cell happens, right? It communicates, it fires, whatever, right? But when the, com the communication is limited, right? And when your brain mainly communicates to your, with your muscles through these, these receptor molecules, right? Through these messenger molecules. Um, when, that, when that ability is reduced, obviously, you're going to have like an issue with the things that receive the, the signaling, right? If you have less, less things to receive it, right? Or if you have no, if you have no receiving molecules or receptor molecules, right? How are you going to receive that message? You're not going to receive the message at all. Your, your connection is going to be poor. Right. So that, 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 that makes sense. Right. Because think about it, right. Your brain is, if I'm trying to, you know, if I send messages by throwing balls, right. Throwing like uh, bouncy balls at people and the, and the people I'm throwing bounce, bouncy balls at have to catch it in order to receive a message. Let's say like a, if I throw a blue bouncy ball at someone, it means I'm sad. Right. I throw it at someone, they catch it with their hands. Oh, he threw me a blue bouncy ball. I'm, I guess he's sad, right? Message received. I'll go buy him flowers or something, right? Same thing happens with the with the brain and the muscle, right? Brain throws a bouncy ball or throws a chemical signal at the muscle. Muscle's like, oh, I know what this means. I have to contract now. Think if I'm throwing at it. Uh, I think now think about it. If I'm throwing that ball at someone with no hands, right? They can't catch it as quickly as someone with hands. Or think about it. If I'm throwing that ball at someone who uh who's who's like blind right they can't see it they can't catch it right same thing with these right the the, the cell can't catch these receptor molecules because it there's an issue um there's this issue with how it receives these these uh molecules right these signaling molecules two it doesn't make sense because the brain failing to send proper hormone signals to vacuoles uh vacuoles don't receive hormones right hormones usually uh diffuse through the cell membrane they just pass in and then they bind to, recept to a receptor located inside of the cell. Vacuoles have nothing to do with that. So we're moving on to number 19. It says the removal of a short sequence of bases from a gene would most likely affect the what? Well, obviously, it's going to be the shape of a protein molecule, right? What does DNA do? Well, DNA, right? Right? Or a gene, right? Say a gene, right? The genes are located on sequences of DNA, right? And what makes up DNA? DNA bases make up DNA. Right, so here I have like A, T, C, G, A, T, C, G, right? These are all bases on my on my DNA molecule, right? Now, what does DNA produce? Well, DNA can produce more DNA, right? Think about tra uh, transcription, but you can also produce mRNA, right? And what this mRNA does, right? It, it goes into a ribosome that binds with the tRNA and it produces amino acids. Or, right, amino acids... When you have a bunch of amino acids together, you produce a protein. I'm sure you learned this in class uh, when you had to do that stupid exercise where you have to like, your teacher gives you like a A, T, C, G. Okay, class, uh, draw what a, what, a, what a translated slide looks like. And you're like, oh, translation, it, it's turned into mRNA. So this, this has to turn into U, A, G, C. And then you're like, oh, okay, class, with that mRNA strand, uh, guess what protein this would make? And then you'd be like, oh, well, UAG, you know, uh, makes lysine, right? So, you know, and then, oh, lysine, ly and the lysine goes into a big chain, right? So if I have a removal of short sequences, uh, for example, let's just say that um, these two sequences, this sequence is removed, right? The CG is, uh, this CG is removed right in the in the dna oh okay my um my software is frozen but as i was saying imagine you remove that cg right uh now now what, what you get is is when you right here at least when you get rid of that a right or when you, whenever you get rid of that c right a small base a short sequence of bases let's just say you get rid of one base now you have atg ATG turns into UAC, and that UAC can can produce like a like a stop codon, right? Which means stop translating, right? So instead of producing lysine, now you're just stopping the production of the protein, right? So instead of having like LYS, GLU, uh, 
I don't know any other things, LYS, GLU, right? And then having a chain like that, you're going to have just LYS stop, right? That's going to change the shape of the protein. Instead of, if it, instead of it being this like long strain, right? It's just going to be, you know, one base long, right? Or say that, say that this protein is supposed to fold into like a square. You have LYS, G, uh, GLU, GLU, LYS. Now you're just left with LYS, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that whenever you have a change or a mutation in DNA, you're going to have a change in the proteins produced, right? Usually in the shape of them. Diffusion doesn't make sense, right? DNA doesn't alter diffusion. pH also doesn't make sense because that's just the amount of hydrogen in the cell and the size of the cell nucleus also doesn't change just because your um, gene sequence is shorter, right? So number 20 says, as energy moves through a forest ecosystem, it flows from herbivores to carnivores, right? Think about it. Uh, just think about a regular food food web, right? It goes from plants, and the plants are eaten by herbivores, who are then eaten by carnivores, right? So the energy really is flowing from plants to carnivores. None of these answers, but also it's also flowing from herbivores to carnivores, right? None of the other answer choices make sense, right? Auto carnivores to autotrophs that insinuates that plants are eating. Carnivores, that doesn't make sense, right? Car uh, herbivores eat autotrophs. Plants to an animals to plants means that plants are eating animals. That doesn't make sense. And heterotrophs to autotrophs means that plants are, are now, plants are eating uh, animals, which doesn't happen. Right, so now we have 21, which says that each winter in the Adirondack Mountains, some of the salt applied to the road to roadways gets washed into lakes. The increase in salt levels in the areas where the increase in salt levels in areas where frogs breed has resulted in more male frogs hatching than females, right? That's cool, right? So you have a bunch of salt, right? Here's a pond, and uh, rather, here's a pond, and the, here's, here's like a road above the pond. And they throw salt on this road, and eventually that salt sprinkles down into this, into this lake, right? Now this lake water is now salty. And because it's salty, it does something to these frogs that make them more male. Right, it gets like absorbed into the eggs, and then the salt in the eggs then makes makes it more likely for that for the thing that hatches that hatchling to actually be a male frog, right? And what this is an, an example of is is an abiotic factor, right, affecting gene expression, right? Uh, abiotic salt is abiotic, right? Salt is not living, right? And that salt is now affecting the gene expression of the frog, right? Rather than developing like a regular female, rather than uh, you know the having that X, X chromosome, that second X chromosome, you know, be, be expressed, right? It's, it's now being suppressed. It's acting like a Y chromosome, you know? Uh, remember that, um, like, this sex is kind of, you know, uh, your genes, right? The, the XY, the XX chromosome, and if there's more XY than more XX, it's an abiotic factor affecting genes because uh, sex is, is dependent on genes. Number 22 says, which substance usually stimulates an immune response. It's going to be antigens, right? Obviously, carbon dioxide molecules, that doesn't make sense or else I, I would be coughing and sneezing and having a fever right now. Uh, biological catalyst also doesn't make sense, right? So really, you're fighting between antibodies and antigens, right? Remember that anti antigens bind to antibodies, right? Antibodies are like these little tri-star things, right? And they have these, these, these sockets for antibodies sorry, antigens to bind to, right? Antigens are located are like these chemical signals located on viruses or located on bacteria, right? It's like these little spikes. And uh, these little spikes then fit into the antigens. And when they fit into the antigen, the antigen triggers an immune response, right? But remember that immune response is triggered when the antigen, which is on the foreign body, the antigen is on the foreign body, binds to an antibody in the system, right? And, you know, the second uh, this binds, this anti antibody, like, releases signals, and it triggers an immune response, or it triggers your cell to produce, like, special virus-killing cells, right? So remember that antigens produce or, or stimulate immune responses, right? Number 23 says, a species of rough-skinned newts produce an extremely powerful toxin that helps prevent attacks by predators. However, one predator, the garter snakes, can eat these newts without being affected by the toxin. 
which statement best explains the resistance of the garter snakes to the new toxin, right? Obviously, it's going to be a random genetic mutation that resulted in toxin resistance, increased the survival rates of snakes that it had it, that passed it on to their offspring, right? Natural selection. Um, why is it, you know, helpful that you have resistance to toxin? Well, guess what? It makes you eat toxic things, right? You could eat more toxic things, you can get more energy, and you could reproduce more, right? Exposure to toxin causing mutation. That doesn't make sense, right? Mutations are random. And also, exposure to toxin, wouldn't that just kind of kill you, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't mutate unless that toxin was radioactive, which it clearly isn't, right? As new as the newts became more toxic, the snakes became increasingly resistant. That's not how it works, right? Uh, you don't, I don't, like, randomly just start growing taller just because I, you know, need to reach things from my kitchen cabinet, right? A giraffe doesn't, ra mad, didn't magically grow taller because the tree is, uh, you know, we're higher up, right? That That's a result of, of natural selection. That's a result of mutations and evolutions, right? The snake needed to become more resistant to the toxin in order to survive. So they develop toxic resistance gene. Once again, right? I don't become, I don't just, I don't just develop the gene to be seven foot zero just because I want to play basketball, right? Uh, doesn't make sense, right? That's not how things work. You don't develop genes, you get genes. And there's a change in your genes, it's usually because uh, of a mutation. So number 24 says, a photo of a magnified protocyte, a highly specialized cell that produces special proteins for filtering fluid in the human kidney. The specialized function of the cell is most dependent on what? Right, so here we have this, this special cell. Its structure is specifically made to filter things, and obviously, right, the, sp the function of the cell is most dependent on Right? the DNA that codes the cell and the activity of the ribosomes, right? Uh, you know, uh, think about it, right? Mutations that produce the cell have a specific shape for filtering blood, doesn't make sense. Uh, differentiation of the cell membrane and functioning vacuoles also doesn't make sense, right? The only thing that can change the structure and the function of the cell is the thing that actually creates the cell. The thing that actually creates the cell, the instruction manual, is your DNA, right? If your DNA says, hey, uh, you're a kidney, right? You're a kidney cell. You need all of these folds, right? I need you to have all these folds. I'm going to tell you to have more folds. Right? Its structure is, is dependent on the DNA that codes for the cell. That, that DNA makes proteins. That, those proteins say, hey, where, 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 where what makes you fold, you know? Mitochondria in the cell that produces filtering organelles. This is also wrong because mitochondria produce ATP not filtering organelles, right? DNA produce all of that, right? I remember just like when you have a specialized function, uh, think DNA, right? It's always going to be because of DNA, right? So if we move on to number 25, it says maintaining stability in an ecosystem most likely depends on what? A high level of diversity and few resources. That doesn't make sense, right? Remember that diversity just means more species. If you have a lot of species and few resources, that's going to be instable. They're going to be constantly fighting over the same resources and a lot of people are going to die, right? Because after a while, if once again, if you have like 20 birds fighting over one species of mouse, right? Guess what? Those birds are going to like run out of food eventually. That one mouse is going to become extinct. It's going to be overhunted, right? You need, a, if you have a high level of diversity, you also need a high, uh, level of, of resources, right? Well, let's say that 20 birds and there's like three trees in the area. Where where are the birds gonna live? They need to they need to build the nests in the trees, right? Say that it's fish in a lake, right? If you have like a million population of fish in, in a small pond, right? They're just gonna eat up all the oxygen in the, in the water. Number two says, uh, a little diversity and rapid e ecological uh, succession, right? That also doesn't make sense, right? Little diversity, right? If you want stability, you want a lot of diversity, right? The more diverse you are, the more stable you are. Number three says a high level of diversity and multiple ecological niches. This is obviously going to be right, right? So obviously, if you want something to be stable, I just said that you need high level diversity, right? So if you're highly diverse, di diverse, right, you're going to be stable, right? You should be stable. But in order for that to be true, you also need a lot of resources. You need a lot of space, right? And if you have multiple ecological niches, that implies that you have a lot, a lot of resources, right? Remember, a niche is a specific role. 
or throw throw back to when I was talking about like the niche of a caterpillar and the niche of a hawk, right? The hawk uh, eats mice, or the hawk eats snakes, and the hawk lives in trees, where the ho- whereas the caterpillar eats leaves, and the caterpillar lives in the ground, right? Those are two different niches, two different roles. If you have a lot of, if you say you have like twenty species and you have twenty niches, that means that each one of those species has something to do. That means that that species doesn't interfere with anyone else's job. Everyone does their job because everyone does their job without having to compete with one another, without having to interact heavily with one another. That means that you are stable, right? If you have one species, if you have two species and they're filling the same niche, if you have two different species of hawks and they're both going after the same mice, if they're both living in the same trees, right? That's not stable. Those, those populations aren't going to be maintained stable. One, eventually one of those birds is going to have to, you know, drive the other one out. They're going to overcompete it. Say one of the birds is, is going to eat all of the mice before the other species of bird is, right? So whereas one population of bird increases rapidly because they just ate all of the mice, right? Another The other bird population is going to decrease rapidly. That's not stable. You want the population to re- remain like this. And the best way you can do that is to ensure that there's no competition, Right? The best way to ensure there's no competition is to make sure that each species has its own job, it has its own niche, where it has its own food source and has its own environment. Once again, little diversity and multiple extinctions doesn't make sense, right? If you want something to be stable, you don't need extinctions. Number 26 says photosynthesis and cellular respiration both involve gases. The gas, the gas is carbon dioxide and oxygen. Which statement best identifies how these gases are involved? Photosynthesis and cellular respiration both use carbon dioxide. No, cellular respiration uses oxygen, right? Cellular respiration uses oxygen, that's correct, and releases carbon dioxide, that's correct, while photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. Choice number two is the correct answer. Number 27 says antibodies produced against one pathogen affecting the human body may not work against a different pathogen because antibodies are what? Well, obviously, it's because... Antibodies are specific for a shape of protein present in one particular pathogen. Remember my diagram that I drew, right? I had this, I had this little, you know, virus guy, and he had cones. He had cone um, uh, antigens, right? His antigen, the, the the chemical signaling on him, or where the chemicals on him were cone shaped, and the antibody I drew was this kind of like this tri-star shape. and it had cones, right? It had shapes for that for the cone, the antigen cones to bind to in order to stimulate a response, right? Uh, here's here's a clo- more close-up, right? See, this just zoomed in there. Uh, this this has a shape for that cone to fit into, right? And, and that cone can perfectly fit into there, and the second it fits into there and binds, it's gonna trigger a response. But say I have that, that exact same antigen, right? But now I have a a virus with this with 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 squares right they have squares on the outside their antigens are square like right is this square going to fit into this triangle hole no it's not going to fit in right and because it doesn't have contact right it's not going to make a response in order for me to respond to this new square virus i'm going to have to make antigens with square holes right i'm going to need this as one of my antigens and now that because this has a specific shape right the proteins present or the antigens present Protein slash antigens present on this virus can now fit into here and can now trigger a response, an immune response, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's the answer. Number twenty eight says multicellular a multicellular organism has cells that perform various roles in that organism. This is most likely due to differentiation, right? I didn't have to read the other answer choices to know that this is right, right? Whenever you have uh, various roles, right? Whenever you have diverse roles, different roles unique roles, it's always going to be a di- uh, differentiation, right? Remember that differentiation is, is when you're, you know, development of embryonic development, right? So you're an embryo, and you, you begin developing specialized cells, rather than just being a cluster of the identical cells. Now you're now you're kind of a cluster of like cells that perform different things. You have like liver cells, heart cell, lung cell, rather than just being a cluster of just like every single identical cell, right? Differentiation, you become different, right? Different roles, different functions, different shape, right? Differentiation becoming different, right? So, and various roles means that the organism has cells that perform different roles. So that's all. Number 29 says the diagram below represents a response that occurs in the guard's 
guard cells of a plant. The changes in the guard cells activity in illustrates what, right? So here I have this, I have sun. So in both of the, oh, both of these, the sun is shining, but the thing that's different is the amount of water available, right? So when I have a lot of water available and I've, and the sun is, sun is shining, I'm going to open my guard leaves, right? I'm going to open, oh, I'm going to open it up. Here's my plant. Here's my, here's my square leaves, right? They have pores. These pores are not going to become open, right? Say the sun is shining, but I have little water available, right? This same plant, my, my pores, guard cells, closed leaf pores, I'm going to have no pores open, right? There's not going to be any carbon dioxide that come in. There can be no carbon dioxide, uh, there can be no oxygen that comes in, right? You need the pores so the plant can breathe, right? But at the same time, those pores are, are, are places where the water, right, the H2O molecules can leave the cell, right? So just knowing that, that, that the thing that, that causes, right, the thing that, that makes this result different is the amount of water available. Let's just look at the answer choices, right? The changes in a guard cell's activities illustrate what? Well, it, obviously it's not an immune response, right? Because if it's an immune response, you need immune, something immune, immunorelated, right? What here is immunorelated? There's no, it's not like a bacteria or a virus is happening. It's not like an immune system, right? This is a mechanical response, right? The guard cells are opening, right? It's it's a response of the guard cells, whatever whatever you know system the guard cell belongs to. Passive transport that doesn't matter, doesn't make sense, right? What are you transporting in response to the sun shining, right? Also, right in response to the sun shining, that it's in, this is all in response to the 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 amount of water available. A feedback mechanism to control water loss. That sounds fine, right? It's to control water loss. What I just say that the, that the more pores you have, the more chances there are of water escaping. Obviously, when you have no water, you want to close those pores so you can keep more water. When you have a lot of water, it doesn't really matter if the water escapes because you have a lot, right? Uh, for genetic manipulation caused by the presence or absence of water, where where here am I manipulating any any genes, right? There's no genetic manipulation happening anywhere here. It doesn't make sense, right? Number three is the only thing that 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 actually like accredits uh, why this is happening, right? This is happening to save water in response to the amount of water, not in response to the amount of sun shining, right? Not in not in um, it, nor is it an immune response, and nor is it genetic manipulation, right? So moving on to number thirty, it says today's whales and alligators both have pelvic and pelvic and hind leg bones, bones. Yet those bones only function in alligators, right? So here I have that bone. Rather, here is my pelvic and hip bone, right? And obviously the alligator uses it to move its its legs, right? Here I have that same pelvic hip bone, and it's like just like buried completely in this in this uh, in the whale's fat, right? And he's not using it. So one species uses it, another species doesn't. Why? Is it that the similarity between whales and alligators support the idea that what, right? So obviously, like you don't need hind legs as a whale. You have fins, right? You need hind legs as an alligator because you walk on land. You don't just swim. So um, the fact that both of these have still have these these bones, right? These similar bones supports what, right? Well, obviously, it supports that they share a common ancestor, right? Because at some point, these both had to have come from someone who had both of them. Somewhere along the line, you know, whale, rather, let me just look at the other answer choices to sh sh share why this is right. Whales evolved from alligators. This, is, this doesn't support that, right? Whales evolved from alligators? Well, obviously, they didn't, right? Uh, but just because two species have a similar bone structure or function doesn't mean that they evolved from one another. That's wrong. What it means is that they evolved from a common ancestor. Somewhere along this, this evolutionary tree, right? Here you have whales, here you have alligators, right? This species, they both come from this species, and this species must have had those same hind legs, right? And as they evolve over time, they still kept those hind legs. They just applied it in different aspects, right? The alligator applied those hind legs to, to move its, you know, sorry, the, the pelvic and hip bones to move its hind legs, right? Whilst the whale kind of just covered it with fat and doesn't use it anymore, right? So, but but the thing is that whenever you have animals with similar, with similar, you know, I want to say like a, 
body parts or, or, or body structures, it's not because they evolved from one another. It's because they evolved from the same, from a, a similar species, right? They evolved from the same common ancestor who once shared those things with them, right? Uh, share the same genetic mutations that Genetic mutations are supposed to be random. If two species have the same genetic mutation, that doesn't really make sense. And alligators evolved from whales, obviously, same thing as whales evolving from alligators also doesn't make sense, right? They just share a common ancestor. So that's all 30 questions. This was all of part um, A or 1A. Uh, if you want me to go over part uh, 1B, right? Let me know in the comments. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Uh, I hope you learned something and I hope you have a nice day.